Obadiah. Obadiahu. Approximately page 617 in the scriptures, if that's the translation that you're using. You ever shoot a 58 minute long Obadiah video and then come to find out your audio input on your computer wasn't working and so you had a 58 minute long video of you being a mime? Yeah, I've never done that either. So, take two, the day after. We will try again. Who the heck is Obadiah? Well, that's a great question because there were no less than 13 Obadiahs in the Old Testament. Fairly popular name. Yeah, kind of like Joe or Bob or I, I don't know what people name their children anymore. Uh, probably something ridiculous like this is Sunflower and Star Anise and Moonstar and whatever. Okay, Obadiah means <laughs> worshiper of Yahuwah. Or servant of Yahuwah. So this gentleman that we're talking about here, Obadiah, there's two different competing theories on the timeline for when Obadiah was written. The first theory is that this was written about the same time as 2 Kings chapters 24 and 25 during the Babylonian captivity, approximately 586 BC-ish, asterisk, which would have made this Obadiah a contemporary of Jeremiah. And the reason that many biblical scholars believe that Obadiah was a contemporary of Jeremiah, because as we will see in the 21 verses of Obadiah, the shortest book in the Old Testament, not in the whole Bible, it's in fourth place for that. There's three epistles in the New Testament that are shorter, but this is only 21 chapters, 440 words in the Hebrew. Um, but this short chapter is paralleled almost word for word in Jeremiah chapter 49 verses 7 through 22. So, a lot of people believe that they were contemporaries. And that's perfectly fine, if you believe that. I prefer the other interpretation of the timeline for Obadiah that has Jeremiah aware of who Obadiah was, perhaps even working off of the scroll of Obadiah having been in possession of Jeremiah, when Jeremiah produced his book of prophecy, I'm not saying that Jeremiah plagiarized Obadiah. I'm saying that he was, it sounds like he was intimately aware of Obadiah and his prophecy. And also, prophecy comes from Yahuwah. So the fact that two different men at two different times said the exact same thing shouldn't surprise any of us. Because that's been happening in this book from Genesis chapter 1 through, uh, through Revelation 22. And remember, more than half of biblical scholars... That's their title, that's their their job, their career, are non-believers. And they approach the Bible from a historical standpoint, which is in of itself fascinating, but not from a spiritual standpoint. And so it doesn't surprise me that more than half of biblical scholars believe that Jeremiah and Obadiah had to be contemporaries because they don't, these biblical scholars don't believe in Yahuwah. Okay, I do. Therefore, I like the second timeline, or the second proposed timeline for Obadiah, which is much earlier, that puts us approximately in the Second Chronicles chapter 21, verses 16 and 17 timeline of 848 to 841 BC, and not BCE, before Common Era, before Christ, before Yeshua HaMashiach, which would have made Obadiah a contemporary of Elijah and Ahab, which is very interesting. So, with that little bit of brief preamble, I don't often do this, but there's a, a little bit of background on Obadiah. So, yes, scholars believe it's difficult to determine the dating of Obadiah due to lack of information regarding the prophet Obadiah. Now, this entire book is about Edom, as we'll see. 
Uh, there's two generally accepted dates. Uh, the first one, which I told you, is approximately 586 BC. The other is approximately 848-ish BC, somewhere in there. According to the rabbinic tradition, and this is interesting in of itself because there's nuggets right in here, and then trust me, we're going to let Yahuwah speak. According to the Talmud, hmm, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, right? Remember, rabbinic Judaism of today traces its roots proudly all the way back to Pharisaical Judaism of the time of Yeshua. And remember, Yeshua said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. And in scripture, leaven represents sin and false doctrine. And it's this in of itself is complicated because uh, undoubtedly, it, it's undeniable that Judaism has been reading and performing, uh, asterisk, the words of the Torah and the prophets far longer than we have, but they have mixed their man-made traditions and their doctrines and their dogmas into it, which is where we get the religion of Judaism from, which is, see, and people miss this in the Gospels, Yeshua is rejecting the religion of Judaism and their man-made doctrines and dogmas when he rebukes the Pharisees. He's not rejecting the Torah of Yahuwah when he rebukes the Pharisees. And because Christendom studies neither Judaism nor the Torah, they cannot ascertain the difference between the two. And they take the Torah, which is eternal forever, the word of Elohim, and throw it in the trash. And they say, that's it was nailed to the cross, brother. Colossians 2. No, it, the Torah was not nailed to the cross. The doctrines and dogmas of men religion was stripped from the Torah because Deuteronomy 4 verse 2 were not allowed to add to or take away from the Torah. That, the, the extra was removed so that the original could be restored. Yeshua is the word made flesh. Well, what's the word? The word is the Torah. Everywhere you see the word of Yahuwah before Matthew chapter 1 refers to the Torah. Yet somehow, inexplicably, on that one thin page in between Second Chronicles and Matthew chapter 1, uh, now the word of God means something else. No, it doesn't, because Malachi 3 verse 6, I'm the Lord Yahuwah Sabbath, I change not. And if Messiah is the physical manifestation of Yahuwah, Messiah can't change what Yah said either. And newsflash, he didn't. You know, Matthew 5, 17. Um, but I, that's a rabbit hole in the rabbit hole. So, rabbinic tradition on Obadiah. According to the Talmud, mm, asterisk, be careful. Obadiah is said to have been a convert to Judaism from Edom. Now, to Judaism. Mm, Judaism, again, I would push back against that. There, there may have been fledgling... Judaic observance, uh, meaning the tribe of Judah observance of the Torah at this time, 2,800 years ago. But following Judaism is not the same as following Torah. But it doesn't surprise me that the rabbis said that he converted to Judaism, not he became a believer in Yahuwah. So I will uh, amend this. According to the Talmud, Obadiah is said to have become a convert to Yahuwah from Edom. And this is where it gets interesting. A descendant of Eliphaz, one of the friends of Job. Have you read the book of Job? One of his three friends was Eliphaz. He is identified as the Obadiah who was the servant of Ahab and was chosen to prophesy against Edom because he himself was an Edomite. Obadiah is supposed to have received the gift of gift of prophecy for having hidden the quote hundred prophets from persecution from Jezebel, which you can read about, I think it's in first Kings. Yeah. With the time of Elijah, second half of first Kings, he hid the prophets in two caves so that if those in one cave should be discovered, those in the other might yet escape. Obadiah was very rich, but all his wealth was expended in feeding the poor prophets until in order to be able to continue to support them. Finally, he had to borrow money at interest from Ahab's son, Jehoram. Obadiah's fear of Yahuwah was one degree higher than that of Abraham. Again, this is according to the prophet, not to the prophets, to the Talmud. And if the house of Ahab had been capable of being blessed, it would have been blessed for Obadiah's sake. 
the degree of fear of Yahuwah, one degree higher than Abraham, I find that interesting. I don't know that I agree with that, but that's an interesting take. Now, with 10 minutes of preamble on who this particular Obadiah was, we're going to do a little bit of map recon because it's going to matter as we read through Obadiah. If you want to take a screenshot, take a screenshot now. Okay. Okay. This is a theoretical land map, approximately 830 BCA, pre-Assyrian exile. So, you will note, as we do our map recon here, I know, best information, worst production quality. Note, in the south, the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, this is before the two houses, before Ezekiel 37, before the two sticks. Okay, but land grants was kingdom of Judah in the south. Judah, Benjamin, most of the Levites, kingdom of Israel in the north, the other ten tribes, Gad, Naphtali, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Manasseh, Ephraim, Dan, etc., etc. Okay? Up here, we have the kingdom of Aram, Damascus, and Assyria. All right? So this is where Abraham was from. Our father was a wandering Aramean. This is where Abraham was from. He comes down here. He wanders all through this area down here and everywhere his foot treads that becomes a land grant for his descendants note the Phoenician states up here Tyre and Sidon we've talked about them and other prophecies other books of prophecy down here in the red I believe it is because I'm super colorblind you have the Philistine city-states Philistine Palestine the Philistines right here Ashdod, Ascalon, Gaza, etc. Over here, kingdom of Ammon, and below that, kingdom of Moab. These are descendants of Lot, Abraham's nephew, okay? But not friendly to the Israelites. And then in the south down here, we have the kingdom of Edom. Note down here, it says Petra. We'll talk about Petra at some point. The kingdom of Edom is to the south and to the east of the kingdom of Judah. To the east is important. We're going to talk about that prolifically in this study. Now, the Jordan River runs through here. Okay, We have the Dead Sea bisecting Moab from the kingdom of Judah here. And we have the Jordan River runs through here-ish. Today, this side of the river over here, the east side of the river, we have the nation state of Jordan, and then on the west side, we have the nation state of Israel, and then it moves down here to the southwest towards the Sinai Peninsula and then Egypt. Okay, so that's our little bit of map recon here. We may refer to this again. If you want to take a screenshot, take a screenshot. I found this map on um, this newfangled device called the internet. You may be able to find it as well. <sighs> And with that preamble, let's caffeinate and we shall read. And per usual, we will read all of it. Try not to interrupt Yahuwah while he's speaking and then come back and go through it line by line. The vision of Obadiah. This is what the master Yahuwah said concerning Edom. We've heard a report from Yahuwah. And a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us rise up against her for battle. See, I have made you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who dwell in the clefts of the rocks, whose dwelling is high, who say in your heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though you rise high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I shall bring you down declares Yahuwah. If thieves came to you, if robbers by night, how ruined you would have been. Would they not steal till they had enough? If grape gatherers had come to you, would they not leave gleanings? How Esau shall be searched out, his hidden treasures shall be sought out. All your allies send you forth to the border. Your friends shall deceive you and overpower you. They make your bread a snare under you without you discerning it. In that day, declares Yahuwah, 
I shall destroy the wise men from Edom, and discernment from the mountains of Esau. And your mighty men shall be discouraged, O Taman, so that every one from the mountains of Esau is cut off by killing. Because of your violence against your brother Jacob, Jacob, let shame cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. In the day that you stood on the other side, and the day that strangers took captive his wealth, Jacob's wealth, when foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were also like one of them. And you should not have looked on your brother's day in the day of his estrangement, nor rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor made your mouth great in the day of distress, nor have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity, nor looked down on their evil in the day of their calamity, nor have seized their wealth in the day of their calamity, nor have stood at the parting of the way to cut off his fugitives, nor handed over his survivors in the day of distress. For the day of Yahuwah is near upon all the nations. If, as you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reward shall come back on your own head. For as you have drunk on my set-apart mountain, so do all the nations drink continually. They shall drink, and they shall swallow, and they shall be as though they had never been. But on Mount Zion there shall be an escape, and they shall be set apart, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Yosef a flame, but the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall burn among them, and they shall consume them, so that no survivor is left of the house of Esau, for Yahuwah has spoken. And they shall possess the south with the mountains of Esau, and the low country with the Philistines. And they shall possess the fields of Ephraim, and the fields of Shomeron, and Benjamin, and Gilead. And the exiles of this host of the children of Israel possess that of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad possess the cities of the south. And saviors shall come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau, and the rain shall belong to Yahuwah. All right. This entire book is about the judgment of Edom, Edom, Esau, the descendants of Esau, red. It's also Edom, is uses the same Hebrew characters as Adam or Adamu, which is mankind or man, the first man, Adam. So the sin here of, there's multiple sins is detailed uh, from chapter 11 through 14 or verse 11 through 14, but it's all rooted in verse three, the pride. Pride comes before the fall. The fall. Have you ever heard that? And so the pride of Edom against his brother Jacob, is what caused all of this calamity to come on their head. They are reaping what they have sown. And that's what Obadiah is talking about in this vision that he's having. And it is a vision, chapter 1, the vision of Obadiah. This is what the master Yahuwah said concerning Edom. Now, we know a prophet is not a false prophet if they prophesy in the name of Yahuwah and it comes to pass. And this has come to pass. This has happened Historically, this has happened, and so we're going to dive into that. The vision of Obadiah. This is what the Master Yahuwah said concerning Edom. Edom are the descendants of Esau. Esau was the twin brother of Jacob, Jacob, son of Isaac and Rivka. Remember, Jacob means uh, he who grabs the heel, also translated oftentimes as... Uh, deceiver, right? Because Jacob, Jacob, when he came out, had his heel on his brother, had his hand on his brother's heel. He who grabs the heel. Later on, as they are older, but not old, Jacob uh, gets, buys the birthright of the firstborn from Esau for a bowl of lentil stew. The book of Jasher, extra canonical text, has a lot of detail on what exactly is going on there. If you haven't read it, it fleshes out significantly the story between Jacob and uh, Esau, Esau. Interestingly, when Jacob goes up to 
Uncle Laban's discount wife emporium and uh, his wife shopping. Why does Jacob, why is Jacob given Leah first? See, we know that Jacob and Esau were twins. But in the non-canonical text and the oral traditions, it has it that Rachel and Leah were also twins. And that a ketubah, a marriage contract, had already been drawn up between the house of Isaac and the house of Laban. Isaac being the daddy of Jacob and Esau, Laban being the daddy of Rachel and Leah. Well, Esau's out of the picture, and Jacob now has the right and the duty of the firstborn. Esau, Esau, had been betrothed to Leah, which is why Laban says, It is not done so in our country, for the oldest must marry first. That's why Jacob doesn't protest. He's not happy, but he doesn't protest. He doesn't back out of the agreement. And then he works seven years for Rachel, Rachel, the one that he loves. There's a lot of interplay in there. Uh, and like I said, it's fleshed out in the non-canonical texts. So from literally birth, Esau and Jacob do not get along. Now the descendants of Jacob, Jacob, remember in Genesis 32, Jacob is renamed Israel because he fights with, he wrestles with Yah made flesh. Who's that? Yeshua HaMashiach. Yeah. The first time we see Yah made flesh is not in Matthew chapter 1. In fact, Jacob literally says, I have come face to face with Elohim and have lived. And this is and he is renamed Israel, Yisrael, which means Genesis 32, he who is struggling with or wrestling with Elohim, he who is overcome with Elohim. How do we overcome? By the blood of the Lamb and the word, capital W, word of our testimony which is backed up in Revelation 14, 12. Here's the endurance of the saints, those that have a testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach and keep the commands of Yahuwah, as we're supposed to. That's the entire point. The whole point of this book, belief in emuna, faith with works in Messiah, 1 Peter 2, 21, and adherence to righteousness, Luke 1, verse 6, blamelessly walking in the commands of Yahuwah. Because we shall not sin. What is sin? 1 John 3 verse 4. Transgression of the law. What did Paul say? I knew not sin but by the law. Okay. So Israel means he who is wrestling with or struggling with Elohim. He who is overcome with Elohim. And he who is ruling with Elohim. And this models not only the behavior of Jacob, of Jacob. But also our own personal walk with Messiah. Back to Yahuwah. First, we struggle with him. Then we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And then we are supposed to rule as kings and priests. Exodus 19, 6, Revelation 1, verse 6. Kings and priests of the Most High. This is why in Revelation 19, the sign that is upon, often translated as the thigh, but it could also be flag or battle standard, that Yeshua has when he returns in Revelation 19 is king of kings. Well, who are the kings? Like many things in the Bible, there's multiple layers there. See, because he also has many crowns upon his head when he returns. And the crowns represent worldly kingship. He has authority over the entire world. And so he is king of the kings of the world. But he's also our king. And we ourselves are to be kings. To righteously rule the little fiefdom that the creator of the universe has given us for headship, leadership, and stewardship. That's Israel. Now, the descendants of Israel, the man Israel, Jacob, become the 12 tribes, which then later become 13. His 12 sons, Joseph has two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and they become adopted by Israel. And so we end up with 13 tribes. They're still commonly numbered as the 12 tribes because Levi, or Levi, doesn't have an inheritance his inheritance is Yahuwah. He doesn't have a physical inheritance. And so the 12 tribes of Israel are the descendants of the man who was Israel. The man who was Esau, when he bugs out from Israel because he's being hunted, read the book of Jasher, 
Why? Because he killed Nimrod. Yeah, big deal. They bug out down here into this mountainous region of southern Israel, southern Jordan, because this is all mountains. And there's a pre-existing people group called the Horites here. And the children of Esau intermarry with the Horites, and they become their own people group of the Edomites here in the kingdom of Edom, south of Moab and south of Judah. Okay? And because Jacob, Jacob, and Esau, Esau did not get along, their children, much like the Hatfields and the McCoys, didn't get along either. And so Edom has been constantly and consistently since the time of Jacob coming against the children of Israel. They are brothers and then cousins, right? Just like the children of Adam, Ammon, the, Bebat, the children of Ammon, the Ammonites, and the children of Moab, the Moabites, they're also in the family. They just don't behave like it. All these people are interrelated here. The Philistines, right? The Philistines, allegedly, can be traced back to Ishmael, who's the first son of Abraham. Now, that's a different rabbit hole. A different, very different rabbit hole. And the kingdom of Aram, Aram Damascus, Aramean, is where Abraham came from in the first place. These people are all interrelated. Big old family. This is like a West Virginia holler over here where each different single wide is upset at the every other single wide. Okay, and they just do warfare against each other. You see why we needed the map recon? It's going to make even more sense in a moment. So, the children of Edom have been coming against the children of Jacob forever. We have heard a report from Yahuwah, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, all these other nations. So Yahuwah has been keeping his eye on this situation. Good to go. And that's good to know for us as well. He's sovereign over all things. Arise, and let us rise up against her, Edom, for battle. See, I have made you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. They were small. They had a small population because they lived in the mountains. The carrying capacity of the mountains is not the same as the carrying capacity of the lowlands and the plains. Yes, you can raise crops, but not as many. Yes, you can have flocks, but not as large because it's the mountains. And so their population density, and it's harder to find places to, you know, pitch a tent and raise kids in the mountains. So their population density was lower. And they were greatly despised. Why? Because they were prideful and duplicitous. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose dwelling is high, who say in your heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? Now remember, this is in the mountains of Jordan. Okay? So their dwelling place is high. They're up on top of these mountains. Though you rise as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I shall bring you down. It shall humble you, declares Yahuwah. Now, you may do a little bit of research here. One of their main cities was a city called Selah, S-E-L-A. You'll also find S-E-L-A-H. Selah is like a closing phrase in stanzas of poetry that are contained in the Bible. Um similar to almost like Amen, let it be so. But Salah later becomes the city of Petra, P-E-T-R-A. Look up the city of Petra. It's incredible. It's literally hewn into the side of a mountain, carved into rock, uh, with huge palaces and great rooms. And, and to access Petra, you had to walk through a narrow uh, channel carved in the rock that was over a mile long. So if you remember uh, the Spartans at Thermopylae, that mountain pass right there where 300 held off the great waves of heathens. Same thing, but this pass was a mile long where you know harassing fire and, 
and all of that for over a mile in order to just to be able to get to Petra. So this is part of what contributed to the pride of Edom. They were very difficult to attack. And also, frankly, they'd carved a civilization out of the rock. That's no small feat. If thieves came to you, if robbers by night, how ruined you would have been. And, and the idea here in 5 and 6 is like, petty thieves would have treated your brothers better than you did. Would they not steal till they had enough? If grape gatherers had come to you, would they not leave gleanings? How Esau shall be searched out, his hidden treasures shall be sought out. All your allies, and remember, because they were a small people group, they were they had allegiances with all these other groups around them, the Philistines, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Arubu tribes, Nabatu tribes, Aramean tribes, uh, because they were small, and so they formed a coalition. All your allies shall send you forth to the border. Your friends shall deceive you and overpower you. They make your bread a snare under you without you discerning it. And that there, they make your bread a snare under you without you discerning it. One of the bits of leverage that one can employ in warfare is access to food because logistics wins wars. And again, they had a small population density, but they also had small production capacity. And so they were dependent upon inter-trading with these other tribes, these other people groups around them. And so what food can be weaponized against people, even somebody that is your ally. Well, how would you do that? Start sending them bunches of food and then stop. Yeah. It takes time to spin up agriculture. If you grow your population based upon an influx of resources and then those resources stop, there's no more incoming resources, how do you support that population? You don't. You have a die-off. It's a tale as old as time. Verse 8 gets interesting. In that day, what day? In that day. We're talking about in the future. This whole thing is being prophesied into the future. Remember, written approximately 848 B.C., or if you want to say, okay, 586 BC, either way, written significantly beforehand in that day. And just remember that phrase, we'll see when that day is, but it's newsflash. It's uh, most of a century into the future. In that day, declares Yahuwah, I shall destroy the wise men from Edom and discernment from the mountains of Esau. Now, in Taman, which was like their capital city, and your mighty men shall be discouraged, O Taman, so that everyone from the mountains of Esau is cut off by killing. These men, they had a strong tradition of wisdom, discernment, if you will. These men from the east, these magi, yes. We're going there. These wise men from Edom, which is to the south and east of the kingdom of Judah. Why does that matter? Because Matthew chapter 2. Men from the east. See, Mount Seir was one of their big mountains that they worshipped upon and that they observed the stars at because Genesis chapter 1 the moon the sun and the stars are for signs signs very important and for appointed times Leviticus 23 the high holy days the Moedim of Yahuwah so these wise men from the east observed signs and appointed times from their mountain top where they were known for their wisdom and their discernment are you picking up what I'm putting down here? Matthew chapter 2. That would be uh, in the New Testament. Come on, thumbs, don't fail me now. Page 920 in the scriptures. And Yeshua, having been born in Beit Lachem of Judah, Beit Lachem, what does that mean? House of bread. 
House of Bread. There's a whole interplay here with Beit Lechem, by the way, this word. Yeshua says, I'm the bread of life. That's Lehem Lechem, by the way. That's a that's a cute little Hebrew idiom phrase right there. Lehem Lechem, the bread of life. By the way, bread, give us this day our daily bread, manna, miraculous provision, protection, blessing from Yahuwah has a gematria, a numerical value, because not this is not numerology, but Hebrew letters, each letter also has a numerical value, which is where we get gematria from. And so words with similar numerical values are categorized to have similar meanings. The numerical value of lechem, bread, is 490. This goes into, Rabbi, Rabbi, how many times shall I forgive my brother? Seven times? No, 70 times, seven times. The numerical value of the Hebrew word for forgiveness is 490. The bread of life, lechem lechayim, forgiveness out of Beit Lehem, the house of bread, Yeshua. It's beautiful. There are layers upon layers upon layers upon layers in this word. And Yeshua, having been born in Beit Lechem, Bethlehem, of Yud, of Yehuda, of Judah, he was a Jew, Jewish man. Okay? Messiah was a Jewish man. There's reasons for that too, which we don't have time to get into today. In the days of Herod the king, because the king was trying to kill babies, the government was killing babies. Where have we seen that before? C. Magi, wise men from the east, came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Yehudim? For we saw his star in the east and have come to do reverence to him. Mm. Mm. Now, what happens? And the king, and Herod the king, having heard, was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And he gathered the chief priests and the scribes and the people together and asked where the Messiah was to be born. And they said, In Beit Lechem of Judah, for thus it has been written by the prophet Micah 5, verse 2. But you, Beit Lechem, in the land of Judah, you were by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. Who shall shepherd who? Yeah, 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 I believe in Jesus. I don't have to do any of that stuff. Who shall shepherd my people? Who? Israel. Israel. Ephesians chapter 2. Romans 11. Cross references for that. By the way, you should have your Bible open and should be seeing this with your own eyes. Don't just take my word for it. Then Herod, having called the Magi, the wise men from the east secretly, learned exactly from them what had happened, what time the star appeared. And so because of this, because the government is trying to kill the children, because Herod doesn't want another ruler to raise up to usurp him to righteously rule, do you see patterns of behavior even to this day? Yosef and Miriam, the parents of Yeshua, bug out to Mitzrayim, to Egypt. Verse 15 and remained there until the death of Herod to fill what was spoken by Yahuwah through the prophet. This is in Exodus and Hosea and Revelation. Out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt, I have called my son. Then Herod, having seen that he was fooled by the Magi, was greatly enraged and sent forth and slew all the male children in Bethlehem and its all its borders from two years old and under, according to the time which he had exactly learnt from the Magi, the wise men from the East. I am saying I believe that these wise men from the East were not from the Orient, were not from uh, Gog or Magog, Russia or Ukraine, were not from Ethiopia. I believe they were Edomites because the Edomites were in the family close enough to know the signs and the appointed times and to have learned those traditions from their elders who are in the family going all the way back to Abraham and were also geographically intimately familiar with the kingdom of Judah 
and could have observed the sign in the eastern side of Edom, the mountainous regions where they dwelt, and made it to Judah in a reasonable amount of time in order to be there for the birth of the king, Yeshua HaMashiach. Now, the Edomites are going to become completely destroyed. And we'll see the timeline on that. But just remember this concept in your head. Because Deuteronomy 23.7 in the Kitetse Torah portion says, Do not loathe an Edomite, for he is your brother. That instruction is for the children of Israel. Even though the Edomites, their brothers, have loathed Israel. Do not loathe an Edomite, for he is your brother. I believe the Edomites had to continue to exist and carry on their traditions of observance and wisdom and discernment, wise men in the East, in order to still be around to inform Yosef and Miriam that they had to bug out to Egypt to preserve the life of Yeshua so that he could atone for our sins upon the stake before Edom was destroyed. Yeah. But bear, it's just a little book. I watched the I watched the Bible video on YouTube. It's four minutes long. I know. And we're 40 minutes long thus far, and we're not done. Because there's so much meat in here. There's so many layers in here. I think we do it a disservice when we try and boil down 21 verses into five minutes. Okay? So verse 8. In that day, declares Yahuwah, I shall destroy the wise men. What day? At 848 BC, the time of Obadiah, they hadn't made it there yet. I'll give you a date. Hold this in your mind. 70 AD. Okay. In that day, declares Yahuwah, I shall destroy the wise men, the wise men from Edom and discernment from the mountain of Esau. And your mighty men shall be discouraged, O Taman, so that everyone from the mountain of Esau is cut off by killing. Because of your violence against your brother Jacob, let shame cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. In that day, in the day you stood on the other side of the Jordan River of the Dead Sea, that strangers took captive Jacob, Jacob's wealth, when foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were also like one of them. Now, this is part of why people like the 586 BC timeline, because that would make Obadiah a contemporary of Jeremiah during the Babylonian captivity and exile. But in 848 BC, the Philistines were significantly harassing the kingdom of Judah, as were the kingdoms of Ammon and Moab. The Ammonites and the Moabites, you can read about this in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 27. Ammon and Moab were destroying Judah. And then the kingdom of Edom joins in with Ammon and Moab. This is also contributory as to why I think the 848, 848 BC timeline is more accurate. And you should not have looked on your brother's day in the day of his estrangement. So when you saw Esau, when you saw Jacob... Edom, when you saw Judah going through this crap, you watched first, and then when it wasn't going Jacob's way, you joined the enemy, and you harassed your brother instead of helping him. We know Numbers chapter 20, I believe it is, uh, when the Israelites are trying to pass into the promised land, the Edomites were like, no, you can't pass through our land. Okay, well, that's really helpful. Thank you so much, brother. Nor rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor made your mouth great in the day of distress, nor have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity, nor looked down on their evil in the day of their calamity, nor have seized their wealth in the day of their calamity, nor have stood at the parting of the way to cut off his fugitives, nor handed over his survivors in his day of distress. Back to Maprikon. Okay. So here's kingdom of Judah. Ammon up here and Moab down here are attacking Israel, Judah, and they were fleeing. Israel and Judah were fleeing to the south. Again, second Chronicles 20 time ish line to the south where they were cut off by Edom. Okay. Between a rock and a hard place here. Look at this. This is a perfect L shaped ambush. Okay. They got them on the long side and on the short side. So as 
the Israelites, Israel and Judah, are retreating to the south. They run right into the kingdom of Edom. And this is what they're being rebuked for by Obadiah. Nor looked down on the evil in their day of their calamity, nor have seized their wealth the day of calamity, nor have stood at the parting of the way to cut off his fugitives, nor handed over his survivors in the day of distress. Yeah, they were the short leg of the L-shaped ambush. Now, traditionally, Obadiah is understood to have two parts, if you will. The first part here, uh, chapter or verse 1 through 14, being the uh, accusation against Edom and the judgments that will come forth. And then the second part, now saying it's for all nations. So it goes just from Edom to all nations. So remember the sin of Edom in verse 3 began with pride and that pride in their heart turned into the unrighteous actions of their hands, right? which is an overarching pattern for humanity. It's why heart condition matters. It's why we read in Joel, tear your garments and not your heart. It's why Yeshua says, if you call your brother an idiot, you've murdered him because your heart condition sucks. If you look at a woman with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery because your heart condition sucks. Okay. And so the heart condition of pride for Edom in verse three is what leads to this judgment that they receive throughout the remainder of the chapter. But also remember that the Hebrew characters for Edom can also spell with just slightly different pronunciation based upon the vowels that are implied but not written, Adam or Adamu or mankind. And so the sin of mankind, all the nations, this can be applied to us as well. Don't treat your brother like crap. And Esau did over and over and over again. His descendants did over and over and over again. But Yah... Deuteronomy 23, 7, do not loathe an Edomite for he is your brother, instructed the Israelites not to destroy Edom because they had to exist by the time of Yeshua. They were part of a fail-safe plan that Elohim was working on for a, uh, for a millennia to make sure that Yeshua would be preserved and could bug out to Mitzrayim so that Herod couldn't kill him. But this applies not only to all of Edom, but to all of mankind, the sin of pride, and which then leads to the unrighteous works of your hands, which then leads to judgment. Now in verse 15, we have, For the day of Yahuwah is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reward shall come back on your own head. What you reap, you, you will sow. Behold, I come swiftly to reward each man according to his works. Revelation 22, verses 12 through 14. I'm the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Right? The day of Yahuwah, the day of the Lord, a.k.a. Judgment Day. We've discussed this at length as we worked through the previous two books of Amos and Joel. There have been multiple days of Yahuwah, multiple judgment days. And I bring this up because, one, it's biblically true. And two, an impending judgment day, say perhaps upon the United States of America, because we have engaged in all of these things and more, even though we claim the name of God, we, we we have transgressed one of the big ten in Exodus chapter 20, taking Yahuwah's name in vain, which doesn't mean saying GD. It means putting his stamp of approval on your bullcrap. Okay? And we do that every day in this nation. Do we murder babies? Yep. Are we engaged in usury? Taxation of more than 10%? Yep. Do our leadership and our constituents uh, bear false witness? Yep. Do we have graven images? Yep. Do we observe the Sabbath day? Nope. Have we made idols out of uh, commerce and uh, money and celebrities? Yep. Is there whoring? Yep. Ever heard of OnlyFans? Go to Las Vegas. The hookers walk right down the street right in front of you. Hey, baby, looking for a good time? Uh, do we traffic in people and product? Yep. Do we rape, pillage, and murder? Yep. Are we engaged in unrighteous wars? Yup. Do we have real spiritual leadership? Nope. 
Are we under a strong delusion in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, being led by the man of lawlessness, who is the Antichrist, and lawlessness is the working of Satan? Yup. Are we unified in our worship? Nope. There's 54,000 different denominations. So have we earned judgment? Biblically, the answer is yes. But it's very important to delineate here that judgment day, the day of Yahuwah, does not necessarily mean the end times. There will be a final judgment, Revelation 19 and 20, at the end of an age. But there have been multiple judgment days for multiple different people groups throughout the Bible. And so just because the day of judgment of Yahuwah is imminent upon a people group, a nation, a race, doesn't mean it's end times. Because for everything there is a season, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And the Edomites get destroyed. But the world kept spinning. It was not the second coming of Mashiach. They just happened upon a judgment day. Because as you have done, so it shall be done to you. Your reward shall come back on your own head. And so they earned and received judgment without it being the end of the world. And that has happened over and over and over again. And there's a pattern here. People worship Elohim and he blesses them. Then they fall away and he sends a prophet to say, hey, you need to return back to your first love. Go back and do what dad told you to do. And they're like, nah, bro, we're good. Okay. And then Yah raises up a subcontractor, an outside nation to come in and destroy them. And then in that destruction, captivity, exile, death, pestilence, the sword, famine, plague, a remnant turns back to Yahuwah and cries out, and then he restores them, and then they worship him again, and he blesses them, but then they fall away, and then a prophet is raised up to say, hey, return to your first love, go do what dad told you to do, and they say, nah, bro, we're good, and then so the father raises up another subcontractor, another nation comes in from the outside, schwacks him, so forth and so on, and that pattern of behavior continues not because Yah is unrighteous, but because people are unrighteous. And the reason he hasn't destroyed everybody to date is because he is merciful and he wants to extend the days as long as he possibly can so that as many as possible will come to belief in him by the blood of Messiah so that at the second resurrection they're not destroyed when the book of life is opened. But nations and peoples get judged constantly in the Bible. And we are not at the end of an age yet. And so I bring that up to delineate between the two because a lot of people are looking at the geopolitical situation around the world right now and saying the United States is going to get destroyed. It must be end times. We must be creeping up on Revelation. And I'm not saying that we're not, but I am saying that for the United States to get destroyed, to be judged, doesn't mean it's Revelation. Okay? Those two things are not codependent. That one does not require the other, biblically. Verse 16. For as you have drunk on my set-apart mountains, so do all nations drink continually. Now this is judgment. This is Revelation 19, the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of El Shaddai. In the pattern of. Okay, because Edom was destroyed. But Revelation 19 hasn't happened yet. So as you have drunk on my set-apart mountain, see Esau came in and was in Jerusalem as Ammon and Moab were in Jerusalem persecuting the children of Israel. They're not supposed to be there drinking on Yah's set-apart mountain. So do all the nations drink continually of the wine of wrath of El Shaddai. They shall drink and they shall swallow and they shall be as though they have never been. There's also a subtle head nod here to the concept of drinking bitter waters, which we've talked about before in Numbers chapter 5 for when a wife is accused of adultery, but it but needs to be found out. There's no substantive evidence. And so she drinks the bitter waters, right? Uh, in judgment and either she did or didn't do it and if she did the water that she has consumed kills her if she didn't she's fine and as they drink they shall swallow and they shall be as though they had never been meaning you've been found guilty of this whoring which spiritual whoring is idolatry 
But on Mount Zion, there shall be an escape. <clears throat> uh, Matthew 24, and let those who are in Judea flee to the wilderness. Again, here patterns, cycles, Ecclesiastes 4. Um, and they shall be set apart. What is set apart? Sanctified, holy. Leviticus 19 is all about how to be set apart. And set apart, Revelation 14, verse 12, if we're going to go to end times actual now. Revelation 14, verse 12, be set apart as I, Yahuwah, am set apart. Here is the endurance of the saints, the set apart ones, those that have a testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach, those that believe in Messiah and keep the commands of Yahuwah, Torah and Messiah. These are your left and right limits. These are your constraints that keep you on the straight and narrow path. The Torah to the left, Messiah to the right. Who is the Word made flesh? Who is the Torah made flesh? Matthew 5, 17. I come not to destroy the Torah or the prophets, but to complete, play ra'u, to embody. For truly, truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one yod, not one tittle shall fall from the Torah till all be done. All has not been done yet, regardless of what you may have been taught about what Colossians 2 means. Because again, what was nailed to the stake in Colossians 2 was the traditions of men, not the perfect word of Elohim. And the reason that Messiah rebuked the Pharisees constantly was because they were doing what men said to do and not doing what Yah said to do. And so he removed all of the man-made doctrines and dogmas and reestablished, reaffirmed the word of Elohim. He is the word made flesh. And the house of Jacob, Jacob, Israel, shall possess their possessions. This goes back to the triune blessing that Abraham is given by the capital M messenger of Elohim, Yeshua, in the book of Genesis. The first is, your seed will be as numerous as the sands of the seashore. The second is, you shall possess the gates of your enemies. And the last is, and in you all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Okay. Jacob, Jacob shall possess their possessions. Now, remember that this is before the two houses. Okay, regardless of which timeline you agree on, this is before the two houses, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. So Obadiah is prophesying here, and he says, In the house of Jacob, the house of Jacob, shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. What? But the house of Esau for stubble. So look, he's using the names of the patriarchs here. Jacob, Joseph, Esau. Well, the house of Esau is the Edomites. So the Edomites shall be for stubble. The house of Jacob is referring to the kingdom of Judah. The house of Joseph, Joseph was Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim is a common um, allusion to the northern kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel. And so before this had even happened, Ezekiel 37, the two sticks, the two houses, because the houses split under, um, under Solomon. There was inklings, see, when David, uh, Solomon's daddy, was first anointed king, he spent seven years as king of Judah in Jerusalem, and then 33 years, seven and 33, both have strong numerical values there, um, and then 33 years as king over all of Israel, total of 40 years in reign. And so they were united under David, and then Solomon comes in, they're still united, but then Solomon engages in a bunch of shenanigans because he had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and he falls into false worship. And when he falls into false worship, Isaiah, your sins have created a separation between you and Elohim, between you and Yah. He's no longer leading the people adequately, even though he's prayed specifically, Father Yah, give me the wisdom that I need to lead your people. And Elohim says to him, because you have asked for this and not riches, nor wealth, nor esteem, I will give you all of these. Well, when he quits serving Elohim with all of his heart and starts bowing down to other gods, false gods, idolatry, because he brought in all these wives from outside, which you're not allowed to do per the Torah, because why? They will water down the ethos of your people. The father removes his hand from that and the kingdom falls apart. And then you end up with the northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah. First Kings, Second Kings, go read them. First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, go read them. <clears throat> but in the time of Obadiah, 848 BC, this hadn't happened yet. 
nor had any of the exiles happened, which he also prophesies. And so I always find it fascinating when things like this crop up as being proof that the father was speaking through somebody hundreds of years in the past when these things come to pass. They're like, oh yeah, Obadiah talked about this. But contemporarily, they were like, this dude's crazy. What do you mean exile? What do you mean two houses? No, no, we're, we're all united and we're all right here. We're not going anywhere. And Obadiah's like, hey, bro, it's coming for Yah has said. And that again goes back to that's how we know this is a prophet of Elohim, because what he has said has come to pass. So the house of Jacob, Judah, shall be a fire and the house of Joseph, Israel, shall be a flame. But the house of Esau, the Edomites, for stubble. And so they're all cats in some heat here, not <laughs> literally fire, but Esau is completely consumed and they shall burn among them and they shall consume them so that no survivor is left of the house of Esau for Yahuwah is spoken. Now, who is the they right here in verse 18? No survivor is left of the house of Esau for Yahuwah has spoken. The they here is the Roman Empire. Esau, whether it was because they finally saw the light or because of political expediency, between the years 66 and 70 AD, the Yahudim, the kingdom of Judah, went to war against the Roman Empire. And Esau joined Judah. And the Roman Empire destroyed not only the temple in 70 AD, Solomon built the first temple, then it was destroyed by the Babylonians, then it was rebuilt by Nehemiah, and then it was destroyed by the Romans. And this is why in approximately 33 AD, when Yeshua says, not one stone shall remain upon another here at this temple. And the Pharisees were like, they used that in court against him, saying he said that he would destroy the temple. And Yeshua said, if you destroy this temple, I shall raise it up in three days. They're like, bro, it took 40 years for Nehemiah to rebuild this temple. But he was talking about the temple of his body, which houses the soul, the nefesh that comes from Elohim, the part of us that is eternal and fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of our creator. That temple that Yeshua prophesied would be destroyed was destroyed in 70 AD. And at the same time that it was destroyed, the Edomites, who had finally seen the light, or because of political expediency, joined up with their brothers Judah, and they took the side of Judah in the war against Rome. And the Romans completely wiped out the Edomites. Culturally, um, genetically, Beidoratov, DNA today, you have a very, very, very hard time finding an Edomite regardless of what the Hebrew black Israelites might say. Um, <laughs> maybe there's Edomites in spirit only, but genetically, they were systematically wiped out by the Romans, 70 AD. And so this judgment that's in verse 8, in that day, in that day, what day, 70 AD, declares Yahuwah, I shall destroy the wise men from Edom and the discernment from the mountains of Esau, and then verse 18, so that no survivors left of the house of Esau for Yahuwah has spoken. That did come to pass in 70 AD, uh, 900 years after Obadiah prophesied. Why? I believe, again, it was because there had to be a remnant in Taman to be the wise men from the east to observe the signs in the heavens as taught to them by their fathers because they are also they are also children of Abraham they are the brother of Jacob they were aware of these things they were raised with these things that became their traditions so that they had this mountain fortress impenetrable mountain fortress where they could be unharassed by and large to observe and to carry on that wisdom so that they would know the signs of Mashiach coming so that the wise men from the east could then bug out up to Judah to come to Mary and Joseph to say, you have to get Yeshua out of here. Herod is going to kill him so that Yeshua could bug out to Egypt where he was stewarded for a time until Herod died so that he could come back so that 
Your sins could be bought and paid for. My sins could be bought and paid for by Elohim made flesh. And that the good news, the gospel, could go out to all nations, to that promise of Abraham, yours in your seed shall be the esteem of all nations. And the Edomites played an incredibly important part in that, which is why the father stayed his hand on their complete and utter destruction until after the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua and his ministry here on earth, and after the apostles and the disciples had gone out and established the roots of the early church, and then tied their destruction to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD by the hand of the Romans. Elohim's incredible. Just incredible. I don't think you're going to get that in a four-minute video on what does Obadiah mean. And now, verses 19 through 21, this goes back to the promise made by the messenger of Elohim in Genesis to Abraham. And your seed shall be the esteem of all nations, and you shall possess the gates of your enemies, and in you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Verse 19, and they shall possess the south with the mountains of Esau. Now, who's they? This is the Israelites. What's to the south? The mountains of Esau. Edom and the low country with the Philistines. Look over there in red. Philistine st city states. Yup. Do they currently? They do currently. The nation state of Israel, which is not the same as the biblical Israel, but they do currently. If you go down the Jordan River, bisect the kingdom of Eden, Edom, on the east side you have Jordan. On the west side you have Israel. And Israel does possess all of this and all of this. And they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Shomeron and Benjamin and Gilead. That's all up here. They do possess all of this. And the exiles of the host of the children of Israel. The exiles. Wait a minute. We haven't been exiles yet. And the exiles of the host of the children of Israel possess that of the Canaanites as far as Zapharet or Saraphat. There we go. Uh, yeah, still in process. And the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad possess the cities of the south. Now, Sepharad, some people, it's kind of an unknown name place. Some people translate this as Spain, um, which is on the Mediterranean Sea, which is a very large body of water, which is why Tyre and Sidon um, and the ships of Tarshish are tied to wealth in the Bible because they went all through there. I mean, you've got... Um, all those states, you know, Northern Africa, Europe, the Middle East, all touched the Mediterranean Sea. And there's a lot of trading that went, went on through there. So it's possible it could have been Spain. But more commonly, it's rendered as Sardis in Turkey. And Sardis was continuously occupied as a um, repository of humanity for 3,500 years. So I'm going to go with the Sardis translation. And the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sardis, Turkey, possess the cities of the south. Ah, again, maybe we don't overlay current 2024 geopolitics over this, but possible. And then verse 21. And saviors shall come to Mount Zion. Saviors could be rendered as deliverers or rescuers. Note it's not a capital S Savior. We're not talking about Messiah here. Although with everything in the word, there's always hints, shadows of Messiah. And saviors shall come to Mount Zion and judge the mountains of Esau. And the rain shall belong to Yahuwah. And saviors shall come to Mount Zion and judge the mountains of Esau. They did in the sense that yeah, the Romans destroyed Esau. Would I call them a savior? Not probably in our modern English connotation or our understanding of who Mashiach is. Although our understanding of who Mashiach is, is often very, very skewed by sop and wet P word pastors preaching on Sunday morning because they're not preaching the second coming of Mashiach, which is Revelation 19, who very much so comes in the model of the Roman Empire. Because his eyes are as a flame of fire and he has a sword and he destroys everybody. The way he makes peace on earth is there's nobody left to start trouble. And saviors shall come to Mount Zion and judge the mountains of Esau. 
so that no survivors left of the house of Esau for Yahuwah has spoken. And the reign, the kingdom, shall belong to Yahuwah. That is Obed Yahu, Obadiah. I pray to Elohim that the audio worked on this one. And if it didn't, I will do it a third time, and a fourth, and a tenth if necessary. Bitachon, Yahuwah's will be done. I appreciate y'all. I love y'all. Please watch these. <laughs> Please share these. Um, we're in a very interesting political season right now, and as a result, our videos are being heavily throttled. And I've noticed all of the videos of all the different types that we put up, the viewership is approximately one-tenth of what it had been formerly. And the way that we get around that algorithmically here on YouTube is for you to share these with people. Um, so, Yas will be done. I hope you found some value in this. I hope you had your Bible out. I hope you took notes. Uh, thank you for consuming the word with me. Shalom.